Good morning, it's nine o'clock on the 23rd of September. Thanks for joining our press conference this morning, um, which is about fair competition in the rail sector and it's how it is crucial to securing EU climate change goals and sustainable recovery in the crisis. Now, just a little introduction about All Rail. We are an association, a rail recognized body at the EU level in Brussels. We've existed for the last three and a half years and we want fair and open rail market, uh, a fair and open uh, passenger rail market system throughout Europe. We think it's the best way to grow passenger rail. And the benefits of rail have been seen over the last three years was followed. We've seen more customer oriented services, improved service quality, big quantities. We've seen greater efficiency in innovation. We've seen reduced fares, higher demand, that means modal shift, which is good for the environment. This has also led to higher sector revenue, higher profits for the operators, including the existing incumbent operators, new jobs, and more private investment. That means less burden on the taxpayer. So it's a win-win for all parts of the passenger rail sector. However, then earlier this year, COVID-19 hit, and it was a pandemic, obviously, like we've never seen before in our lives. It's had a severe effect on our members, the passenger rail operators and ticket vendors that belong to all rail. And in this press conference, our president, Dr. Eric Forster, who has been president of all rail since the beginning for the last three and a half years, would like to give you his view on, on what to do next. So I'm gonna hand over now to Eric, and um, then after that, we'll be taking questions and hopefully answering them in an adequate way. That will be myself, Eric, and I think our vice president, Christian Schreier, will be there as well to, to answer some questions. So without further delay, can I hand over to Eric Forster, please? Thanks a lot, Nick. Uh... As well, welcome from my side. Good morning and, and thank you for joining our press conference. And um, as Nick said, uh, I think we should go back one year. Uh, one year ago, uh, Mrs. van der Leyen announced the Green Deal, uh, announced uh, 1,000 billion of investment to save the climate. And uh, I think it's very clear. If we're talking about uh, Green Deal and climate, then it means that uh, rail is in the center, in the absolute center of this future project. And uh, after COVID hit in uh, March uh, this year, very, very dramatic, uh, it's, I think, useful and necessary to have a review where are we standing now and how is the chance uh, for the Green Deal uh, to profit from the whole uh, railway sector uh, as it is necessary to be successful in the future for the community and for the climate and as well for the companies and the employees uh, that are working for the railway companies. Uh, well, let's have a first look. Uh, what's about help programs uh, for the different uh, railway companies in the member states? Only some examples for you to, to, to give you an overview where we are standing at the moment. If we look at Germany, yes, there is a help program uh, for some uh, PSO services and there is a proposed capital increase for uh, DB. But it's very, very clear we are lacking and missing the same help programs for open access providers so there is a big difference and it's no clear and no discrimination free help program. The same in Czech Republic. There is a help for PSO operators, but for long distance open access providers, you have no real provided program. If we're looking to another example, Netherlands, Slovakia, long, PSO services, direct awarded contracts for incumbents are provided that help automatically as well in the crisis and, and, and so now, but uh, nothing for anyone else. And uh, another example, yes, there was help from the beginning with an emergency PSO uh, contract for both ÖBB and Westbahn. Uh, offering services, but it's now over at the beginning of October and there is no clear plan 
how a follow-up health program will be there. So the major problem is that we have no consistent and reliable health scheme in place. And this means there is a big, big risk that uh, the competition is distorted in the passenger rail sector. And this will, on the long term, mid and long term, have a very, very negative effect uh, for the whole rail sector and for the Green Deal. If you see uh, this situation at the moment, and you think about potential investors that before the COVID crisis might have thought about an investment in rail, and they know very clearly investing in, in rail means 20 years, 30 years duration to have uh, really the investment back. And if you look at the crisis with only help for uh, incumbents uh, in most of the countries, this means automatically that potential investors will be under fear whether another crisis that may happen in the next 20 or 30 years and probably will happen as 20 or 30 years are not really a short time, uh, it might be the same. So it's high risk that potential investors are not willing to do the investment, but exactly this is necessary for the Green Deal because the Green Deal only with state incumbents is really not possible. I think we can skip and go to, to, to uh, the next point. Uh, is COVID really with the second wave a big surprise? I think no, because it was very clear for the last half year after March that there is a high risk that there will be uh, a second wave, that this second wave will exactly uh, be in the same critical uh, way as the first one with reductions, uh, with restrictions, and exactly uh, hitting uh, the travel industry. And we are still waiting for a strategy, for a complete program that uh, will be presented, that will be ready to have all the companies, the whole sector uh, with a basis to have reliable, uh, clear basics that uh, it's worthwhile running all the services. And uh, this is really very critical. Uh, it means that uh, at the moment there is no equal treatment of uh, private newcomers and uh, the state incumbents. More or less everything is concentrated, but it should be a top priority of the community to have everyone uh, secured for the future because public transport uh, only works if there is competition in. Everyone is uh, very clearly supported to have uh, a basis for the future. And in, in my opinion, very clearly, EU must act very fast. Anything else is really uh, a big failure. And if we talk about EU, we don't mean uh, Brussels or uh, the parliament uh, especially, because if we look uh, at uh, Brussels or the Commission, then we see the only one structured relief plan driven uh, by the Commission was the relief plan for track access charges. But the major problem is that there is a so different action in all the 27 uh, member states. So it's very critical, especially for uh, international running services. Is there a treatment in the one hand side or in the other direction? It's not easy for the companies. So there is a big risk and it makes automatically big losses for the companies if there is no help. So the major point is that we need fast action and we need action in a coordinated way by the transport ministers of the uh, EU member states so that uh, there is uh, equal treatment in all the countries and as well for all the companies in the railway sector. Railway companies, as well as distributors and so on, the whole sector is really under pressure. And if we go to the point, what does the rail passenger sector need? Then I want to say very clear, 
uh, we have now a basis with uh, the regulation to reduce the track access charges. A uh, very, very good basic approach, but now it means, and it is necessary, that all the 27 member states act in the same way. And very clearly, we need a zero, really zero, track access charge, especially for open access services where uh, there is automatically not a help, uh, maybe in some of the countries, but in general not. Must be running not only now in 2020, but must be running as well in 21. This is absolutely basic and the minimum that is necessary. And as well, there should be a clear support for all the companies uh, with uh, short work programs and so on. And whenever uh, this is not enough, it's necessary to provide additional aid programs for open access services, uh, for newcomers especially, to help them not to be uh, out of the market in a few months because of the crisis. And the same for uh, ticket vendors. Uh, and uh, they especially also need help because no travel, no international travel automatically means that there is no booking. So they have no revenues, they have no income. This is absolutely uh, crucial and critical for them. Only if the help is provided in the right way and really fast, and I mean fast, in, in a few weeks necessarily done, then it's possible for the companies to save the employees. And without that, there is a big risk as well for the employees in the rail sector. So uh, if I go to the way and to the steps that are necessary uh, out of our opinion, then very clearly, it's necessary to act fast. I think uh, we should look at other examples that might be not perfect uh, in, in the general sense, but in, in some of the sectors of the industries, there was help provided very, very fast. Uh, as well, if we, uh, if especially if we look at air and so on. And uh, it's necessary to do it very, very fast and fundamentally. And absolutely without any discrimination, it must be held for everyone, not only for the state owned companies. Because what does it mean uh, to help in a not discriminatory free way? It means that there is a high risk to distort the competition for the future. We hear and we see some of the incumbents at the moment say, oh, no problem. Yes, uh, we will run the services as well in the future. We will have losses, but we run the services. But what does this in fact and in total mean? It means that at the very end, these companies uh, are providing services, yes, and they make losses. But at the very end, with these losses, there is the need for the states, for the ministers of finance, to help them, to capitalize them, and at the very end, it's not cost-free, but it costs dramatically uh, money as well, although it seems at the moment that there is no cost, that there is no investment necessary, but it comes. And the second point is, if some of the member states are waiting with the help and not helping as well the private competitors, they might go out of the market and then you have only the state incumbents then you have the monopoly back. 20, 30 years of work to have liberalization, to have uh, competition in the rail sector might be finished in between one year because of the crisis and the not stable and clear and discrimination-free health program. And the monopoly afterwards is much more expensive and will not support the Green Deal in the same way. So, I only can repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. There is a need for help, fast help, really stable help. And to be honest, no necessarily discount.
discussion at the moment about uh, a project like TE uh, for the future with ideas of the 60s of the last century. Uh, that's absolutely the wrong way. I think uh, all is clear how to really provide the future for the rail sector and for the transport sector. There was a white paper nearly 10 years ago, everything is written in, everything is clear. It was not done in the, in the way as it was suggested by the commission, but that's not the problem of the commission. There, there were a lot of other uh, problems. So now really dramatic need of help for everyone in the sector and as well, yes, discussing for the future, but even if we discuss about the future with night trains and everything else, it's always clear, discrimination free. Uh, give a chance for everyone, uh, as well newcomers and uh, startups to, to enter new services and uh, without automatically subsidized uh, services, except for COVID crisis. So I think it's necessary to do help at the moment, massive help to provide the future. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much, Erich, for that summary. Um, and now we come to the question and answer session. And I think we also have our Vice President, Christian Schreier, there too, and uh, myself. And I think the first question I have already, and it was sent to me by email this morning from the Polish Railway Magazine, RK, is uh, can you give more details on your opinion on the Trans-European Express 2.0 um, that was uh, announced or suggested by the German government two days ago during the EU Transport Minister's Innovative Rail Transport Conference? Um, wh why don't you think that's such a good idea? Who would like to begin? Perhaps Christian? Okay, good morning. Um, why I don't think it's a good idea, I think it's a good idea if railway companies work together better, if we uh, start developing one European rail market. But uh, the idea of the TEE revival is going back 20 years into time. It's a cooperation of national rail operators that hand over uh, service at a border. It's not really a real re European rail network with fair competition where private competitors can develop own lines uh, themselves. The idea is really to combine and to cooperate between the state-owned rail incumbent, and that's not a step forward, it's a step backwards into, into history. Okay. Right. Thanks. Um, Erich, would you like to continue? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, Christian said it, and I, I tried to, to start up uh, the, the TE idea uh, is absolutely not future oriented. Uh, if we want to have a future oriented uh, idea, then we need to support that more and more newcomers, startups enter the uh, rail business, give a very, very dynamic scenario uh, where there is more offer for the customers competing with uh, attractive prices, perfect service, so that there is uh, absolutely uh, the same uh, as in, in air business. Uh, it's only about the customers. It's only about uh, having them, uh, and I mean air business before the crisis, uh, having them uh, served in the best way with attractive conditions to make them happy, to have uh, a lot of experience and more choice uh, between the different operators. Okay. Great. Now we have a question from Kevin Smith of IRJ. Um, can Erich, you provide an update on the situation in Austria? Is Vespan likely to secure the support it needs beyond October? What indications or assurances have you received from the Austrian government so far? Uh, well, uh, we are still in discussion with the with the government, but we no sure that there will be a health program uh, from from uh, 8th of October. So we will know more in the next few days. At the moment, it's a little bit too early to 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 have a final 
say, overview, but uh, we already clearly uh, offered uh, the Ministry of Transport mid of July uh, that uh, we have an idea how to, how to prolong uh, and uh, with a special timetable and with a special uh, plan how we need relief to have uh, the crisis managed and as well the services provided. We're still waiting to have uh, a final announcement by the ministry in which way uh, they want to support uh, the, the, the railway service uh, of uh, ÖBB and Westbahn for the next uh, for the next months. Very clearly, we see in Austria as well that there is a big, big uh, increase now of infections, and we saw, especially in the last uh, week, that the demand is going down very much. Uh, if we only compare uh, the last weekend with the weekend before, it was minus twenty percent. Uh, in, in frequency and, and the same in, in revenue. So very clearly, uh, there is a, a need for help in the future as well, but at the moment we don't know, and we're waiting day by day to know more uh, what uh, the ministry is, is ready and, and able to do. Okay. I, thanks very much. I have a question now from the Rail Talk magazine of the, from the United Kingdom. And the question is, let me just get it here one moment. Will, will night trains play a role in helping the rail sector recover after COVID-19? <laughs> Eric, do you want to begin with that one? Uh, well, I think uh, if we look at the night services provided at the moment uh, by uh, especially uh, ÖBB, uh, we see uh, that it's a, let's say, very traditional offer uh, with most of the coaches 20, 30 years or, or more of age uh, with a very basic quality. And to be honest, I think this is not the future. This is absolutely not the future, uh, especially if we are uh, now driving the direction of a new monopoly. Because uh, if uh, there is, uh, say, uh, a prolonging of uh, the way as it's now uh, working out that several uh, member states want to have new PSOs uh, for this very old styled uh, night service, there will be some kind of monopoly in the future. And this is absolutely not the future. We need, uh, I think, out of the Green Deal, a support to have new ideas uh, in the, in, in the uh, night services uh, supported. And we need support that more operators, more private uh, startups enter the service. We have very few. Uh, Christian Schreier can tell you more afterwards. But I think we need support that more newcomers enter the, the market. And so, uh, as I said before, there will be uh, a setup with more competition, with more new ideas, with more creative ideas for the future, and not only uh, couchette cars uh, pimped up uh, for for the next 30 or 40 years, uh, which uh, from the style is uh, 30 or 40 years old. So moving on then to Christian, you're, you're also, uh, in addition to being Vice President of URail, you're the CEO for Transdev for Central and um, Northern Europe. And you have a night train operator that's part of your portfolio. So perhaps you'd like to make a few comments on where it's going I, with night trains. Yes, I do believe in night trains. Uh, it, night trains will always be a niche market, but it can be a very interesting niche market. I think night trains can be really an addition um, to uh, the current offering of long, long distance trains. It can become far more international than, than train service are today. It can be a good alternative to uh, air transportation and by that support the Green Deal topics. The question is how to do it. There are private operators in the market that are willing to develop night train lines internationally without public subsidies. But they can only be competitive if not in parallel. State-owned railways will be subsidized by member states and by that have an unfair uh, competitive advantage uh, to the private ones. So for me, there's two top options. Either you do it as a PSO, but then you do a proper tender and you prepare it and you invite the privates um, 
to offer and you give it you give long term uh, contracts or you leave it to open access and uh, to the competition there are more and more offerings developing on the market so let's give them a chance and not interfere by subsidizing uh, state old uh, uh, state owned railway companies like UBB who are now starting to form a cooperation with SBB, for example, the next one will be the other national train operators. So we will never, we will really, like I said before, we are turning time back. It's the same like with the TEE. If we do not pay attention now, in five years, all private rail companies, at least the open X provider, access providers will be dead because uh, there is no uh, fair level playing field. Okay, thanks very much. I have a question from Mark Giesel of MAV, um, which is a railway company based in Germany. He asks, the clock phase timetable seems to be a concept that is gaining traction in Austria, Germany, Switzerland, of course, where it originates from. Is this a future model that will help the industry recover after COVID-19? Should it be applied to all of Europe? Who would like to answer that one? Erich, do you want to? Do you have an opinion on the clock face timetable? So that's in Germany, it's called the Deutschland Pact. Uh, well, uh, I think you have to look at the different uh, countries in a very different way. Uh, I think if there is a big network with uh, a lot of different uh, centers, then uh, a coordination uh, of the timing of the different uh, rail services is absolutely uh, a good idea. But this does not automatically mean that you have to provide a service only by one railway company. It, it could and it should already uh, work as well uh, if different operators try to link the services in some of the hubs to have a, a better uh, basis for the customers uh, to use different services. I think uh, a clock time uh, timetable is a useful uh, idea. Uh, it's absolutely not useful if there is a, a plan or a PSO order to concentrate uh, only then on, on state incumbents that, that would automatically mean, uh, as Christian said before, that uh, we are going back to the past and, and stop competition. I think uh, it must be uh, differentiated between the different uh, companies, uh, uh, between different countries, because France is completely different uh, with uh, Paris as one center to say Germany or Austria or Switzerland. Hmm. Okay. Christian, do you have an opinion on the clock face timetable? I, I only have an opinion uh, to the Deutschland Tag in Germany because I know that best. I don't know so much um, really the detailed planning in the, in the other uh, member countries. Uh, in Germany, I think the Deutschland Tag has big opportunities, but it also has risks. Uh, and it's a topic, the Deutschland Tag needs to be very well prepared and harmonized. It's on the one hand, a big infrastructure, issue the infrastructure needs to be prepared to be able to deliver that um, Deutschland Tag and we must pay attention like Eric said that at the end it's not only one operator that uh, can can deliver that and we are going back into Deutsche Bahn times but I think it's also an opportunity because one day we might then also tender the long distance uh, train lines and then you have really, you don't have this strange differentiation between regional rail operators, which is a PSO contract, sometimes runs 300 kilometer, a line is 350, or an ICE line. So you, you can really order all train sets um, uh, by the government and, and tender it. So it's a chance and opportunity for competition, for more customer orientation, more passenger orientation. Um, and more stability of the rail network, but it's also a, a threat, so it needs to be managed well. Okay, thanks. Then moving on to the issue of ticketing, which Erich touched upon during your speech earlier on. Earlier this week, sorry, late last week, five NGOs, five climate NGOs in Europe uh, issued five 
suggestions to re to, to, to help passenger rail grow in the crisis. And two statements that they made are as follows. There's no publicly accessible platform that shows all existing train connections in Europe. It's not possible to compare prices and book international rail tickets at an online one-stop shop. And they also suggested that to end this, the EU needs to mandate transport operators to share static and dynamic data, load factors, real time, including all fair data, with all digital platforms so that they can show and sell all the real offerings. Um, Erich and Christian, do you agree with this uh, statement by these five climate NGOs? Or what do you think of impartial, transparent rail ticket retail? Should we, should we start with Christian this time? No. Maybe, maybe let's start with Eric because this is more his home turf than mine. I have an opinion regarding that, but I would like Eric to start. Uh, well, I think uh, it's essential that all data are provided by all railway companies, all timetable, all real time table, uh, real time uh, data, and as well all tariffs all conditions so only if the customer has a chance to see everywhere uh, on state incumbent uh, home pages uh, as well as on uh, private uh, platforms which offers are on the market all private incumbent uh, so that he has a complete view has an easy choice and has uh, the, the best basis to grab uh, the uh, optimum price, then we have a chance for rail in the future after the crisis to compete with a car and with air. And this is essential and therefore it's absolutely clever, necessary and future oriented to have a basis that everyone provides all data to everyone, all the uh, private platforms as well. I, I, would, I would add on that, I share everything that Eric said. And on top of that, everyone speaks about mass. Mass is the, the modern word, mobility as a service. If you really want to speak about mobility as a service and you do not share data, it's just impossible uh, to create um, point to point connections with different modes of transportation with different operators. It's such a basic thing that you need in the 21st century to share data, to give uh, the passenger the best uh, travel experience and possibilities that he deserves. So it's not only having end-to-end -end information and having end-to-end -end booking by, by rail, it's also organizing the last mile eh? because usually a trip doesn't start at the station and ends at the station. Uh, a trip starts at home and ends at an office or in a hotel or with friends. So it ends not at the station without sharing data you will never have a have good mobility as a service um, platforms and that's why ca countries like netherlands and um, and finland are very much um, ahead of countries like germany where uh, the cities the the verkehrsverbünde are sitting on their data and are not sharing them deutsche bahn is sitting on their data and are refusing to sharing them so we don't need to speak about mass if we don't start with step one which is sharing data Thank you. So related to this, we now have a question from Mr. Maurizio Castelletti, who's the head of the rail unit at the European Commission's transport director at DG Move in Brussels. And he asks as follows, we need rail connections over medium to long distances across borders, particularly across borders, to shift traffic from air to rail and achieve modal shift. How do you promote connected services? For example, by means of co-chairing agreements like in aviation? What could be the role of ticketing to improve rail connectivity over such medium to long cross-border rail journeys? Uh, I think uh, it's very easy. Uh, we, we need uh, integrated ticketing. Uh, and if you look at uh, Transdev with, uh, with uh, their company in, 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 in southern uh, Germany, in Bayavaria and, and Westbahn, uh, we offer an integrated uh, tariff to, to run between Vienna and Munich. All the companies, there should be really the possibility to link uh, the tariffs and have through ticketing 
between all companies. Uh, as it is possible between two private companies and, and operators, it should be also possible to be between private companies and state-owned, uh, which you never see at the moment. And this is one of the big barriers that uh, stop a development uh, in the rail sector uh, for the future. And uh, all the ideas like TE to have once more only state incumbents uh, linked together uh, provide a very much different future uh, and not looking at what the customers need uh, to have more variety and possibilities uh, to, to ride fast easy and cheap but here i would like to add here really the european union has to do something in rail in each border a totally new world starts different legislation different uh, driver licenses um, you need to be fluent in all languages which doesn't exist on the road doesn't exist in the air in the air you have one shared language it's it's english you have one the pilot license that is valid in both countries. Uh, you have similar technical rules. You have the same European train control system. It's SARS, ETCS, it's different in every country. Um, we need to harmonize the legislation between the countries. It's totally easy to run a bus from Munich to Paris. No one cares. You have a bus, you have a bus driver, and, and, and you operate. Now try to install a new train line from uh, Paris to Munich. It's a nightmare until you have all regulations, driver licenses, approvals, code sharing. It's just a nightmare. So you better run a bus on the road, which is not green deal. I'm not against buses. Uh, it's much better than air travel. Don't misunderstand me, but it's not a fair competition because every border, a new world starts. And that's for me the biggest hurdle in really developing more international mid to long distance uh, rail connections and that's why we are still in this world of uh, cooperations between state-owned railways that hand over more or less the, the operations at the border it's the same train it goes there but the whole crew is changing everything is changing at the border um, here we have to work great Barbara, did you have a comment to this? Or... Okay, great. Then um, I think we can get to the final questions now. Uh, if you've got any more questions, please post them online here. Um, but one of the final questions then coming up is about the Netherlands and Slovakia. Um, in the middle of this crisis, we've seen new direct awards to the state rail incumbents in Slovakia and in the Netherlands. Um, do you think that this is connected to COVID-19? I am, at least in the Netherlands, I'm totally sure it's connected uh, at the end uh, to Corona. What happened in the Netherlands? All public transport companies, had huge problems because most of the PSO contracts in the Netherlands are pure net contracts, means all the passenger revenues go to the operator and not to the PTA, Public Transport Authority. So with a drop in passenger revenues by 90%, everyone is in big troubles. Uh, then there was a long ba discussion about the bailout program, how to how to um, help these public transport operators. And at the end, there was a bailout program, which is quite not satisfying for uh, transport companies. At the end, they they cover ninety three percent of your costs, means you have seven percent losses. It doesn't matter what you do; you have to do open book. Uh, and for one one year, most of your companies will survive that but not not for longer and the same problems occurred uh, with uh, dutch railways ms so instead of adjusting or improving the bailout program they could they, they which they did not want to give to foreign private companies because most all of the competitors of ns are foreign private uh, companies or most of them private companies they decided not to improve the bailout program but to protect ns uh, differently by awarding them 95% uh, of the core rail network to operate it until 2035. It means that the market stays closed for another 15 years to give NS the chance 
to gain back the losses they have made this year. So for me, this is a clear hidden uh, estate aid that you do not want to give to private operators, but only to your uh, state incumbent, uh, state on incumbent railway. That, uh, I'm convinced of that. I don't know the Slovakian situation so well, and I know the Dutch. Okay. Right. Are there any further questions at all during this press conference? Okay, I'll just very briefly then, before we finish, summarize what we went through and what Eric talked about. It was about COVID-19 help for passenger rail. So far, there have been weak and consistent, unreliable help schemes and that, that can dis greatly distort competition in the passenger rail sector. This will heavily affect modal shift to rail and as a consequence, it will um, negatively uh, affect the, the success, the potential success of the EU Green Deal. Because for the EU Green Deal, we need competition. We need more passenger rail. And for passenger rail to grow, we need more competition. We've known that there's been a second wave coming. It isn't, hasn't been a surprise at all. It's been being indicated for the last couple of months. This time, we need equal support for private and state-owned passenger rail companies, whether it's operators and ticket vendors, to get through this crisis. All of those companies that existed before COVID-19 should survive this so that when the, the vaccine is there, and of course we don't know when that will be, but once the crisis is over and it will be over one day, all those companies that were there beforehand, both privately and publicly owned, should be, able to, should be able to return, they should be back on the market to serve the uptick in passenger rail. The EU must act fast. Anything else will be a clear confession and failure. And, um, and of course, we'll lead to, if, if, if private companies don't survive this crisis, we've got to think about the jobs as well. There might be a lot of jobs that, go, that get lost. Um, we must finally let the single European rail market become a reality. That's so, the single European rail area is also called. It must become a rail system with the ambition to sustain itself financially. We can't keep going down a path to more and more subsidy. Some people have talked about cross-border PSOs to boost passenger rail, but I don't think we've seen a PSO of that type before that has then, so over time, become uh, commercially sustainable, commercially viable, and moved into open access. If anything, we see that when there's subsidy for, for cross-border rail, it just gets larger and larger and larger. Instead of going down, subsidy goes up and up and up and that surely can't be what the European Union is about. We need faster market opening and we need equal conditions. These are the, the methods, the two key methods to achieve a sustainable and successful European passionate rail system going into the future. If you want to find out more about us, what we stand for, we are very active on social media. You can see us here, our contact details, but you can see we are, we've got a website, um, we've got Twitter, we're very active on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. So do keep following us. We've got a message, we've got a narrative. Um, we are not going to stay silent. I mean, it, it's good that the new privately owned non incumbent passenger rail companies that operate and ticket owners now have a, a, a voice across Europe, and we intend to, to play a constructive part as, as, as the EU passenger rail sector moves on. So based on that, I want to say thank you to our speakers, Eric Force, and thank you to Christian Schreier. And um, if you've got any further questions at all, do send them to us at our email address, which is info at allrail.eu, or, or contact us by direct message on, on Twitter, or give us a call, and we've got a telephone number as well. Um, thanks for your time today, taking part in this press conference, and we hope to do more of these. As, as the next couple of months proceed. So um, thanks very much and uh, wishing all of you a very good day. Thank, Thank you. you as well. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.